Okay, welcome back to Astronomy on Tap ADX number 16. Um, we have, once again, an awful lot of astronomy in the news this month, so we're going to race through this quickly. All right, so since uh, late January and through February 20th, all five naked eye planets will be visible in a nice line. So here's a picture from Tucson, Arizona from a couple weeks ago. Uh, so this is in the pre-dawn hours, so either stay up real late or get up real early. I prefer the former. Uh, and you can see the uh, five planets all in line. This hasn't happened in about a decade. It'll happen again in August, but Mercury and Venus will be even harder to see from Austin. So check it out in the early morning hours in the next few nights. Uh, the couple hours before dawn. Um, so this image went viral a few weeks ago. Um, this is Julian Wessel's image of the International Space Station transiting Saturn, um, which it really did, passed in front of Saturn. Um, but if you know anything about geometry and the universe, um, the two very obvious things that are wrong with this image. Um, the ISS should be a lot brighter than Saturn. It's an awful lot closer to us. And the sizes are all completely wrong. Um, so this went viral for a week at the end of January. Um, the photographer said on his website, I managed to photograph the ISS in front of a planet again. This is a great effort for me as an astrophotographer. It takes time, patience, preparation, and a little bit of luck to get a shot like this. But at the end, the hard work pays off. Um, sadly, this is totally photoshopped. Um, so I guess I mean, the hard work of learning Photoshop kind of paid off. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the relative sizes, brightness, sharpness, is, none of it makes any sense. Um, not to mention it was actually very cloudy the morning that he claims to have taken this photograph. Um, so it wasn't really so much preparation and luck as pure BS. And the images have since been taken off his website. Um, but we do have a real um, video of the ISS passing in front of Saturn. <laughs> and... That is what it actually looked like. And um, this was taken by, oh, am I going to get this right? Sabolc Naj. Where's Judith? Did I get that right? Awesome. Right. Um, a Hungarian um, who actually caught the ISS transiting Saturn on January 25th from the Canary Islands. So, yeah, be, don't believe everything you see on the internet. <laughs> All right, so the James Webb Space Telescope, back on February 4th, just a couple weeks ago, the 18th and final mirror segment was installed at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, where we know quite a few researchers out there, actually. Uh, so you can see they use sort of this big crane sort of uh, claw game to put in these mirror segments. Each mirror segment weighs about 88 pounds, four feet across, so sort of coffee table sized, uh, and all 18 have now been placed. Uh, in addition, they're working on different um, testing of both the mirrors and some of the instruments. Uh, uh, one of the instrument tests actually happened during the snowpocalypse uh, a few weeks back. And so a team of astronomers actually literally lived 24 hours a day for a few days in Goddard to watch this test. And, you know, they were sort of trapped there by the snowpocalypse. Uh, so I appreciate their dedication and I'm very thankful I live in Austin, Texas. <laughs> uh, so next we have some sad news. Um, those of you who have been with us for a while um, may remember last April um, a talk from Dr. Comet, who is over there, about the Philae lander, which landed on a comet in November 2014. Um, this has sadly died. Um, the European Space Agency has finally given up trying to communicate with it. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce the name of the comet it's sitting on. Um, it's a long name. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> so um, its mothership, Rosetta, is still out there. It will still try to communicate, but no one's expecting to hear anything. Um, so it, Philae landed on the comet on November 12th in 2014, and the last contact was on July 9th, 2015. Uh, on January 25th, uh, we had the 12-year anniversary of the Opportunity Mars rover, which you see here, uh, landing on the surface of Mars. Uh, so this thing was sent uh, back in 2004 with the twin Spirit uh, rover. Spirit uh, stopped working a few years ago, but Opportunity is still chugging along. It's now the longest rover mission in NASA history. It's roved about 27 miles, so longer than a marathon, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and, you know, one, one thing that they like to point out, NASA really likes to tout, is that the original mission plan for Spirit and Opportunity were not, was 90 days. So this thing has outperformed its warranty by almost a factor of 50. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty impressive. You can't get that a lot of uh, hardware stores. Uh, I actually got to meet Steve Squires, who is the, the principal investigator for these that guys, and I was like, 
come on, 90 days was a total low ball, right? And he's like, yeah, it was, but we, we literally thought they would die before two years. And I was like, I call BS on that too. And he said, no, we actually used an extra antenna from one of these on the next Mars mission, the Mars Recon Orbiter. And so when that got to Mars and these things were chugging along with the same antenna, they had issues with communicating on the same channel. And they're like, we would have never done that if we thought the rovers would still be alive. <laughs> so I was like, all right, that's pretty impressive. Cool, very, very cool. Um, so, not to be outdone, um, the Curiosity rover took a new selfie on January 19th. Um, Curiosity landed on Mars on August 6, 2012. It's an awful lot bigger than Spirit and Opportunity, um, more like the size of a car. Um, this, um, this rover is currently sitting on the Namib dune, um, where its activities, its very exciting life, includes scuffing into the dune with a wheel and scooping samples of sand for analysis inside its onboard laboratory. And it took this very, very nice selfie for us last month. That is not photoshopped, I promise. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have in the lower right corner a picture of a pretty famous galaxy called Centaurus A. Uh, this is a galaxy that has a big black hole in the center, like many galaxies. That's, and this one is cool because it's swallowing a lot of material. Some of that material gets heated up and spewed out in those jets that you see coming into the top left and top right of that image. Uh, those jets are bright in radio and x-rays. The little diagonal thing across the middle is this dust lane, this dark material that, that blocks out a lot of optical light. And so this is a very well-studied nearby cool galaxy, a mere 12 million light years away. So, you know, backyard for us. What's cool is two uh, amateur astronomers down in Australia, uh, and they have simple names, uh, Peter Marples and Greg Bach, discovered a new supernova, so near and dear to my heart and my research, uh, marked up in that top left picture. So this is a very nearby supernova, probably one of the nearest by supernova in the past sort of 10, 12 years. Uh, people are still working on it. We're, you know, working on it, getting a lot of data. We're looking at it. We don't exactly know what kind of supernova it is quite yet. There's some argument. I was talking about that earlier with uh, Professor Craig Wheeler. But we think it was a massive star, maybe 10 times the mass of the sun. It had some hydrogen. So to be continued, but very cool, nearby, relatively bright supernova. Um, so next up, we have something that in any normal month would have been our top story. Um, this was on January 20th. Um, a team found evidence for a possible ninth planet in the solar system. Um, this team includes the Pluto killer himself, Mike Brown. <laughs> so what they actually detected um, was six small bodies in a distant stretched out elliptical orbit. And um, that's these magenta lines on this image. Um, and they say that a a uh, newly found distant planet could be flinging all of these things um, way out there. And this distant planet would follow this orange line over here that's labeled Planet Nine. So this possible planet, still only a possible planet, um, would have to be about 10 times the mass of the Earth, probably with a rocky core and some kind of thick atmosphere. Um, distance from the sun would range from 20 billion to 100 billion miles, which is pretty far. It's about 4 to 20 times further away from the sun than Pluto. So this is why we haven't seen it before. Um, one year on this planet would be between 10 and 20,000 Earth years. Um, so this isn't the first time a planet has been discovered with this method. Um, it was oddities in the orbit of Uranus that led to the discovery of Neptune 170 years ago. So this isn't completely out there. It's completely possible. Um, the downside is that it's expected, uh, they weren't able with these data to pinpoint where Planet Nine would be in its orbit currently, but it's probably at its most distant point from the sun. And when something is the furthest from the sun, it's moving the slowest. So it's gonna stay out there for a very long time. It's also probably against the background of the galaxy, which is very bright. So it's going to be extremely difficult to see, but obviously a lot of people are working very hard on this. So if it's possible to detect it, we should hear about it fairly soon. Um, so to keep up with the latest results on this and observations and so on, there is a website, um, findplanet9.com. We have detected gravitational waves. We did it. So that was David Rizzi, uh, head of the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, also known as LIGO. Uh, cool note, he got his PhD in physics from the great UT Austin in 1990. Uh, and so this was, there you go, hook him. Uh, so this was his announcement on Thursday uh, of the detection, the first direct detection of gravitational waves. Uh, this was huge, the internet exploded, Twitter went nuts. It was pretty awesome. Uh, so we're gonna give a quick rundown here of sort of 
some of the initial stuff that we thought was really neat. Uh, we'll have more on this later, we promise. Uh, so first off, gravitational versus gravity waves. Gravity waves are sort of stuff in the atmosphere on the surface of an ocean, that kind of wave. Gravitational waves is the actual space-time itself stretching and compressing, and so you see highly exaggerated version of that on the Earth there as it wiggles back and forth. Uh, this was something that was predicted from Einstein's general theory of relativity. All of you are experts on that. You remember our centennial celebration back in November. Uh, and so this was sort of something that was predicted about 100 years ago, and we finally have a direct detection of those things. Um, so an interesting note for those of us in Austin, Texas, um, the original manuscript where Einstein wrote down his equations about gravitational waves is held here in Austin at the Harry Ransom Center. Um, s someone, uh, the girlfriend of one of our graduate students in the astronomy department actually works there and put this manuscript out on display last week. Um, so it's going to be out on public display until February 29th. Um, go and see it. This is an awesome piece of history. Um, so, brief explanation of what gravitational waves actually are, what this detection actually means. Um, you will all remember, of course, from our centennial um, celebration in November, that um, gravity, according to Einstein's general relativity, is the distortion of space-time. So you have a very he heavy object that actually bends space-time. So if you just have something heavy sitting there, the curvature in space-time is pretty fixed. But if you have two very dense, very massive things, like say two black holes that are orbiting each other and falling in and merging, this is going to cause a ripple, um, a ripple effect in its distortion of space-time. And this is what we call a, call a gravitational wave. So the detection that was announced on Thursday was two black holes. Um, one is about 29 times the mass of the sun, the other about 36 times the mass of the sun. Um, they spiraled into each other and merged to form one larger black hole. In the process, some of this energy is converted into these ripples um, that spread out through space-time. And this is what was actually detected. Those gravitational waves travel across the universe for 1.3 billion years before they eventually hit the Earth. And the way they're detected is you have two detectors in two different cities, um, which were one is in Washington, it's the name of the city, Hanford, Hanford Washington, and um, one down in Louisiana, in Livingston. Um, so very far apart, um, the, the length of the US apart, and they wiggle slightly differently because of this um, gravitational wave rippling through space. The like amount that they're, the distance that they're measuring, the difference between the measurement in these two locations is less than the width of a proton. So it's extraordinarily sensitive. Um, but the signal is actually pretty strong. What you're seeing on this slide here, the red and the blue, are the two signals from the two different locations. Red is Washington, blue is Louisiana. And you can see where the signal peaks over here, they overlay on top of each other pretty perfectly. So this is a really pretty solid detection. Um, and what's really exciting about this is every time we've opened a new window into the universe, so the first time we launched an X-ray telescope, the first time we had an infrared telescope, we've discovered things, the things that we thought would be there, but also things we had no idea to expect. So we have a pretty good idea of what we should expect to see in gravitational waves, things like merging black holes. But this is even more of a new window than X-ray and infrared were. This isn't just another wavelength of electromagnetic radiation. It's a whole different type of radiation. And so there is bound to be a bunch of stuff out there in the universe that we had no idea we should expect. And that's pretty exciting. So um, obviously, the, um, the science Twitter sphere got very excited about this on Thursday. And being the very, very serious scientists that we are, um, we all decided to try to imitate um, the chirp um, sound that was played at the press conference. Um, now, just so no one gets confused, um, gravitational waves don't make sound, but they do have a frequency, and the frequency is pretty similar to the um, range of our hearing. So you can convert it into a sound and play pretend, and it's pretty fun. So you may recognize a face in here.
Uh, but there are many more of those on the internet if you go and search for Chirp for LIGO. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> so here is one of the papers, the official first paper, and the author list. <laughs> About 10 papers uh, came out after the announcement uh, from LIGO and uh, Virgo, another uh, gravitational wave detector. Uh, the full paper, the full author list has 1,012 authors. That is the full list of them. Uh, and so already just in the first, you know, handful of papers that have come out, we've learned a lot of stuff, a lot of really cool stuff that we weren't sure about, didn't know yet. Um, Einstein was right yet again. His equations match what was observed basically exactly as we can measure it. Uh, the graviton, which is the little thingy that carries the gravitational force, appears to be massless and appears to move at the speed of light, so kind of like a light particle called a photon. People are still working on that, but that's what it looks like right now. Um, there's probably a bunch of these events going on all the time, these gravitational wave events. This first detection was detected pretty much right after they turned on the upgraded version of LIGO. So if you turn something on that's brand new and it immediately gets a hit, there's probably a bunch more hits floating there. So that bodes really well for future detections. Uh, word on the street, grumblings and rumors, says that there's probably seven more detections that they already have that they're gonna write about soon. So pay attention to those coming out, hopefully. Uh, the fact that these big black holes exist and can merge into each other and create an even bigger black hole. We had some ideas about that before, but this is sort of some pretty solid direct evidence. Uh, people have claimed that they've seen sort of 20 to 30 times the mass of the sun black holes, but in their paper, uh, they say that uh, they don't quite believe those previous masses. Uh, they say recent work cast these previous black hole masses in doubt, therefore we don't consider those claimed black hole masses as reliable. This is from their official collaboration. One of the papers that they cite of having this unreliable mass <laughs> is some guy named Jeffrey M. Silverman. Um, so this is my first astronomy paper and the only one that's not on supernova. I got cited in this LIGO paper as getting the wrong mass. <laughs> There's no up citation or down citation. Citation's a citation, so I'm <laughs> counting it, baby. <laughs> uh, so that was our very, very brief um, background and summary of this really awesome and like paradigm-shifting announcement. Um, watch out for um, the next few Nobel Prizes in physics. Um, we're expecting them to go to the three founders of LIGO, Kip Thorne, Ronald Draver, and um, Rainer Weiss. And we're very happy to say that, oh God, why did I get all the difficult to pronounce Ugolini. names? Dennis Ugolini of the LIGO team, who is marked down here <laughs> on the very long author list. Um, he is a professor at Trinity University in San Antonio, and he's going to come to Astronomy on Tap next month to talk about this result. Yeah.